in this place. There's something special going on here. You are here in the will of God. What we have been hearing is in the will of God. I, I feel like we've been hearing from specialists, men that have gone that extra mile to give us what we needed to hear. And after hearing what I heard last night, Brother Mangan, Brother Fuller, Brother Urshan, that song has been on my heart ever since. I've got to live the way he wants me to live. I want to give until there's just no more to give. I want to love till there's no more love. And doing that, I could never outlove the Lord. Thank God for these men that have a real insight. And that's why you're here. I'm going to try to do my little part. It's not very much. Thank you, Brother Leroy, for that beautiful introduction. It's all right for you to say it. If I believe it, I'm in trouble. And uh, I told Brother Barnes, Brother Barnes pulled a fast one on me. I told him in the office I was going to get up and make an introduction and introduce the real specialist. And he got up here before I did. I forgive you, Brother Barnes. <clears throat> but uh, we're here in the will of God. And we have heard from the Lord. Now, you could go home now and feel like it was worth everything. It was worth the expense. It was worth everything, worth the trip. And Sister Mangan stirred my heart again. She has that special way of just getting hold of your heart and squeezing it and, and just squeezing it some more. And I was so proud of Ronnie Beckton this morning. If you don't do anything, just make sure you're here. Amen. I, just, I can go home and say, I was there. Did you preach? No, but I was there. Some of us will wish we hadn't preached. I didn't sing, but I was there. I was there. And what a challenge. And I feel like that we certainly have been challenged to do better, to be better. And... Uh, some of us are going to be, and thank you for that beautiful song that we just heard. My, that was, that was beautiful. Praise God. I've been feeling after the Lord trying to find out for sure what he wanted me to do. And I'll tell you, like I told our committee, I'm, I don't have the preacher's itch. Now, I, I can preach. I heard one preacher say, you wake me up at midnight and just let me shake my head a couple of times and I'm ready to preach. I can't relate to that. I, I, I'd like to wake up and have a cup of coffee and, and just sit there a little bit and, and my wife not say anything to me. Just... <laughs> She wakes up every morning. She's so bubbly, and she's as beautiful when she wakes up as she is when she goes to sleep. Now, that's the truth. And uh, she's ready to talk. I'm not ready to talk, and I'm not ready to listen. I... <laughs> Finally, I tell her, honey, just be quiet. <clears throat> But I, I'm always ready to preach when I feel God has spoken to my heart. And the Lord uh, definitely speaks to our hearts. I, I like to be able to get up in my pulpit and say, Folks, I have heard from the Lord, and here is what God wants. And when I do that, I'm not afraid of anything or anybody and uh, what a refreshing to hear Elder T.W. Barnes stand up here and, and in prophetic tones give us what he gave to us. Thank God for men like that that have an insight, that have that special touch from God. And if ever a time in our lives we need that special touch, 
that special touch, that certain something that brings you out of the realm of the ordinary. Now, I know that, that we are just ordinary men, and I want you to look at that every time you come into the service. That's me. I'm just an ordinary man. I, I'm an ordinary man. I have an extraordinary God, an extraordinary gospel, and the challenge of the hour is an extraordinary challenge, but I'm just an ordinary man, that's all. You look in the book of Hebrews, the 11th chapter, the heroes of faith, and you look at these men and say, they're heroes, they're supermen. They are men that, that don't belong to this world. But when you read their lives, you find out that they were just ordinary men. They made a lot of blunders and a lot of mistakes, and they had a lot of failings in their lives. But, you know, after they're all listed, the Lord says, I am not ashamed to be called their God. If that be true, and they're just ordinary men, and some of them sinned, some of them failed, some of them made a lot of mistakes, then that gives me a lot of hope. Somehow I can make it. So if you're just an ordinary man, remember, God used ordinary men just like you. Just exactly like you. He used ordinary men. And uh, I feel like that he wants to use many of you. And, and there have been so many of you young preachers that have come here through the years to find a direction for your life. And you left because of the times, and you knew the direction God wanted you to go in. There have been some of you that have come year after year seeking that direction, and you really knew the direction God wanted you to go, but somehow when you got back home and the humdrum of the everyday life, you did not do what God wanted you to do, and so you're here again. Now, you'll never become what God wants you to be until you make up your mind. There's got to be a determined effort, not a resolution, not a desire, but a determined effort. I am going to be everything that God wants me to be. And when you make up your mind to do that, you go home, you will be different, you will be changed. You will have a different ministry. You'll have a good direction. You'll know where you've been, why you're here, and where you're going. Uh, don't live in a confused state. My wife and I con conducted a minister and wife seminar a few years ago, and I felt somewhat of a heaviness throughout the seminar. There were a number of preachers and their wives there. Finally, the last session, she was with the ladies, and I was with the men, and I had them to bow their heads for a moment. I said, I'd just like to ask, how many of you are definitely, positively sure that you're in the will of God? And uh, there were a number that raised their hand, and I noticed that there were some that could not. Nobody looking but me. I said, now, I want everybody, you're not sure that you're in the will of God. Thirteen pastors raised their hand. They were not sure. I said, do one of two things. Go home and renew your burden and your vision. And uh, let God really speak to your heart. Or go home and resign. It's not fair to that church. It's not fair to you. It's not fair to your family to just uh, mess around and say, I've got a good living. I've got a good little church. And... I'm making it fine. Don't have that attitude. Go home and say, I'm going to renew my burden and my vision, and I'm going to see something accomplished, or I'm going to resign. I'm going to get out of there. That church will never progress as long as you have questions and you're confused and you are wondering whether God wants you there or not. We just celebrated our 34th year as pastor in Life Tabernacle, and it has been a wonderful feeling every time I step to that pulpit to know beyond the shadow of any doubt that that's where God wants me, that that's the will of God. I have a faith when I preach that I could not have otherwise, just knowing that I have renewed my faith and my vision and my burden 
and I can get up and tell those folks what I feel they need to do, and they say, that's my pastor. He's in the will of God, and I'm afraid to do anything else. I'm going to do what he wants us to do. Please. Get a direction from the Lord here and go in that direction. That's the purpose of the cause of the times when we met together, Brother Anthony Mangan, Brother Mike Williams, Brother Tenney, and myself, and we began to talk about the very first meeting. We wanted to lay a little groundwork. We want this to be a place of inspiration and a place of challenge and a place where heartbeat could be with heartbeat and burdens could be shared, and and visions could be realized. This was our desire, not to grind any axes, and not to have any pet peeves, and and, uh, not to try to humiliate or embarrass anybody, but just to try to give direction. And through the years, you have kept coming back because you knew this was the place where God wanted to give you something extra special for these last days. And we are receiving it. We are receiving it. The very first year, I'll never forget, I was preparing to preach, and I was in the Spirit. First time in my life God ever really gave me a vision, and God gave me that vision. And when He did, I I wept, and I wept, and, and, and I cried, and... And I got to talking in tongues, and and uh, I, I knew it was from God, and uh, I didn't intend to tell it. But when I got up to preach that night, I said, I want to show you and tell you the vision God gave me today. And the Lord reminded me early this morning that that vision is still alive. Amen. He showed me the building over here where we were having the first meeting. He showed how it was so packed with young men and young women. They had their Bibles in their hands. And all of a sudden, the Spirit of God began to move in that congregation. And I saw young people soar through the walls with their Bibles in front of them, going in every direction. And I saw them going into demon-infested areas where the powers of darkness was prevailing. And all of a sudden, this book became a a weapon in their hands. And they began to fight the demon powers and drive them back. And I said, God showed me that some of you young people are going to do that. You're going to go places. And this word is going to become a weapon in your hands. And you're going to be able to defeat the enemy of your soul and have revival, end time revival. Holy Ghost Revival. I saw some of those young people as they began to soar into areas that was so dark. That was so dark that you could feel the darkness. You couldn't see a thing. And all of a sudden this book became a light that began to penetrate the darkness. I saw the darkness begin to roll back. It began to flee to get out of the way. I'm telling you, nothing can stand in the way of the Word of God. This is the most powerful book in the world. It's a lamp. It's a light. It's a weapon. Praise God. God showed me young people that went into places where there were people locked up in prison. There were walls. There were chains. There were bars. And all of a sudden, as these young people began to go toward these places, all of a sudden, this book became a key. And it it fit right into the lock. And the doors were open. And the captives began to run out. And they were freed. I'm telling you, God has used this meeting for young people have been able to get a a good fresh touch from the Word of God and to go forth with victory and with anointing and with power. And so here we are, 1992, and uh, we need a fresh anointing. We need that fresh touch from God. I don't mind to tell you, while Anthony was preaching last night, the tears flowed. 
I, I hugged his neck. I said, son, I didn't realize how hungry I was for the Word of God. I, I've been giving it out and giving it out. I was so hungry. I hugged uh, Brother Fuller's neck. I said, Brother Fuller, I wept. I cried. I thank you for that powerful message. How it thrilled my heart. Thank you for preaching to me. We need to be preached to. God has, has chosen by the foolishness of preaching to save those that believe. And we've been hearing the preaching that we needed to hear. And I was challenged by that. My general superintendent challenged us again. I don't know of anybody that can preach the gospel any better than he can. When he preaches the gospel, I'll tell you, something stirs within your soul. So we've been hearing it. Now we need that fresh anointing. That anointing that takes you from the realm of the ordinary to the extraordinary. We need that special touch and anointing that takes you from just the anointing to the Shekinah. There was something about the Shekinah glory of God. I've never understood it. I have looked to try to find it. I have tried to explain it. There is just something about the awesomeness of that Shekinah glory. The only way I know to describe it, it was in the tabernacle, in the Holy of Holies. And I can see that priest once a year as he takes that little basin of blood. He doesn't rush up to the labor. He doesn't rush by the candlesticks and the showbread and the altar of incense and say, I can hardly wait to get in to that Shekinah. He was very careful. He knew that he was anointed. He knew that he was touched. But he knew that there was something special. That it took more than just the ordinary anointing. And I think he was very careful. And he took little steps. And he took careful steps. And he took consecrated steps. And he took dedicated steps. And he took steps that were cleansed and washed. And he just eased that little vessel to that great dividing between the holy and the holiest of holies. And he carefully put the blood in there. And then he thought, that's all right. I'm all right now. And he went right in to the very Shekinah of God. And by sprinkling that blood, the sins were rolled ahead for another year. There was a cleansing. There was a deliverance. There was relief. On that day, the head of every family stood in the doorway of his little tent. And every tent was situated to look straight at that tabernacle. And that man stood there trembling. Oh, I hope the Lord approves this day of atonement. And when they finally see the glory cloud, that's another part of the Shekinah, rest over the tabernacle, they have a sigh of relief. We can go on another year now. Uh, we've been complaining and murmuring and we have fallen in the wilderness and a lot of things have happened. But God is allowing us to go on another year because we've been in the Shekinah. We have been in that awesome presence of God. I think the Shekinah was like when the temple was dedicated and the trumpeters and the singers and the worshipers all of a sudden became one voice. There was not different sounds, but it sounded like one voice that went into the very presence of God. Hallelujah! Lord! Glory to God! Ah, hallelujah! 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 120 priests were standing at the altar. The same numerical number that was in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. They were standing there ready to minister. But all of a sudden, the glory of that Shekinah came down in that place. And it dwelt in that place. They couldn't do a thing. They had to just step back all stricken. 
They couldn't understand it, but oh, they were feeling what they needed to feel. This is so good. We just can't leave this place. No wonder Peter, James, and John said, it's good for us to be here. We saw the Shekinah. That's something that was deep within him. He was God manifest in the flesh. And all of a sudden, God began to go through that clay, that temple of clay, and through the clothing that he wore. And there was a deep shining on the outside of that that was deep on the inside. And it was the Shekinah glory of God. Oh, hallelujah. 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 No wonder they said, it's good for us to be here. Every one of us have been anointed. Oh, what could happen before this meeting is over if all of us would forget about who we are and where we are and what we think and would not find one fault with anybody. And all of a sudden, we would come to that place of one mind and one accord. I'm telling you, the anointing would become the Shekinah. Hallelujah. And something would happen all over this building from one side to another. It's got to be that way. It's got to be that way. My dad went into a place preached the gospel for the first time. He and my mother went on a 21-day prayer vigil, praying 10 to 16 hours a day, getting ready to go into a place that was hostile, a place that was full of opposition, a place that was full of unbelief and skepticism. Yes, Sister Mangan, prayer is still the key that will unlock every door. And so the first night came for his meeting, and uh, he just stepped to the pulpit, and the sinners looked upon his face, and they broke down and began to weep with deep conviction. Twenty-one days in the presence of God. Twenty-one days fasting and praying and waiting. And something happened. They saw the glory of God. That night, the very first night of that meeting, 18 brand new people received the Holy Ghost. The second night, the same thing happened. He stood at the pulpit before he could preach. They began to weep and cry. They were in the presence of God. They saw something and they felt something that they had never seen or felt before. And 18 more received the Holy Ghost that night. Before that meeting was over, the saloons had to close down. They couldn't have a movie. They couldn't have a picture show, they called them in those days. There, couldn't, there wasn't any other activity in all of that community because the glory was resting over that one place. I don't want to be satisfied with just the anointing. I want to go a little beyond the anointing. I want to reach that place of the Shekinah. I want the glory of God to envelop my life, to saturate my life, to take hold of my life, to turn me wrong side up, to make me what I ought to be, to get the job done. In this last day, praise God. No wonder, no wonder the things that are happening in Ethiopia are happening. No wonder Sister Freeman described it in terms that I had never thought about. Said she was in the meeting and she felt such strength and such power and said it was like you were wading into something that that was deep, and and you could feel it, but she didn't quite understand. And finally she turned to our leader there, and, what is this that I feel? He said, that is perfect unity. 
Oh, oh, I'm so hungry for that. Perfect unity that brought the Shekinah into that place. Oh, my. No wonder the dead are raised. No wonder the blind eyes are open. No wonder they receive the Holy Ghost by the tens of thousands. It's because they have gone beyond the anointing and allowed that anointing to become the Shekinah. We're too satisfied to preach our little sermon and feel like we even we're anointed. I want to tell you, I don't ever rush to the pulpit. Sister Mangan, you said it so well here today. I fear and tremble when I when I look at those when I look at those dear people that have stood by me and that have sacrificed when I asked them to. That give over four hundred thousand dollars every year to foreign and home missionaries. When I look at them and some of those young people don't go buy a new car because they're afraid they can't meet their faith promise, it, it slays me. It, it does something to me. I'm not satisfied to get up there and just preach a little sermon and say, I've been anointed and now I'm going home. I want that anointing to live with me. I want it to go to the pulpit. I want it to go to the altar. I want it to go to the counseling room. I want it to go home with me. I want to feel the effects of it everywhere I go. I want that anointing to become a Shekinah that I can live in. Hallelujah! And I'll tell you, the keynote in this meeting has been anointing and to know Jesus. To know Jesus. That relationship with Him. My Lord, help us. I want a relationship like I have never known. You can have it. I can have it. The world can see it. They can feel it. They can know it. I'm telling you, it's something tangible. It is something real. Paul and his conversion on that road to Damascus. That conversion became a deep conviction. A conviction that, that I am a debtor to the whole world. That conviction became a commitment. He said, as much as in me is... I am ready. That commitment gave him a burning, consuming desire to know the one. Paul, you wrote about him. Paul, you preached about him. Paul, you converted the heathen. What do you mean? Oh, I just, I just want to know him. I want to know him. The power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. If I want the Shekinah, I've got to go a little bit further. I, I, four years ago, I, I had Daniel and Jan come back and work with me. I was tired. I was burnt out. I was half sick. And I thought, now... I'll lay back. He was like a son. And his heartbeat was right with my heart. Thank you, Brother Mandin, for putting that picture as a memorial to him. Thank you. And I uh, thought, I'm going to lay back now. I'm going to rest. I'll just kind of guide things from the sidelines and he was going to take the building program and go with it and all the programs. And he was working so faithfully and so regularly. And then all of a sudden he developed a hurting in his shoulder. One doctor thought it was bursitis and began to try to treat it. And it got worse and finally went to the specialist. And the specialist said, it's multiple myeloma. 
And uh, I, I refused to accept it. When I stood here a year ago, I refused to accept it. I was not going to lose him. I, it was not the will of God, I said, for him to go. And I, I wouldn't even let myself say it. I wouldn't let my wife talk about it. I wouldn't let my daughter talk about it. And she tried to talk to Daniel. He said, wait a minute, Jan. Wait a minute. Listen to me. I want people to let me die. You've got to let me die. God was speaking to him evidently in a definite way. And of course, he left us. I was thrust right back on the firing line again. I feel tired in my body, but I feel strong in my spirit. I'm working longer than I've ever worked. I spend more hours than I've ever spent. I don't hunt. I don't fish. I don't play golf. And I'm not condemning anybody that does that. I, I have a one-track mind. I, I seem like I, I'm consumed with this. I, I, I get up every morning and I, I think about it. I go to bed at night thinking about it. I've got to do more and the sun's going down. The coming of the Lord is me. Got to do more. Got to do more. And I keep pushing myself on. And there are times for the man when I feel like that I'm, I'm just going to fall. I'm, I'm so tired. And all of a sudden, there's an extra spurt of strength. And I think, why do I feel this way? And then I think, somebody just prayed for me. Somebody just call my name. I feel like going on. But I'm telling you, if we want that extra step, we've got to be willing to go a little bit further. You see, in the Garden of Gethsemane, the Bible said he went a little further. Hallelujah. Someone said to really know him, you have to be blind to see and deaf to hear and dead to live and die to live and suffer to feel. And I really believe that. I really believe it. I preached a meeting many years ago for an old blind preacher. Such a sweet old man. In fact, I don't know if I know of any blind people that are full of bitterness. I've tried to think. I've known a lot of blind people, but all those that I've known, they've been cheerful and and you talk to them a little bit, and they don't complain. They, they don't, you know, I'm sure they suffer. But there, was, there was no complaints in this man. And when I got through preaching, I said, who built the church? One of the members said, uh, our pastor, Brother Vermillion, built it. I said, you mean a blind man? Yes, he laid it out. He sawed all the boards. He nailed the nails. And it was a beautiful church. You couldn't find any imperfections in it. He did it all living in a world of blindness. He was seeing something, though, that could not be seen by ordinary vision. He was going a little beyond the ordinary. Amen. If somehow all of us could get blind enough to the things around us and dead enough to ourselves, we might really in that blindness behold Him and see Him and enter into a love relationship. I uh, read the scripture a while back where the Lord said, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And I said, God, I don't know what that means. You're going to have to tell me. You're going to have to teach me. I hear a holiness from one angle and from another angle. And if I try to live by every man's holiness, I'll end up pulling myself apart. I said, I'd really like to know what your holiness is. He said, if you really want to know, follow me through my word and through my ministry. And I saw him when he had compassion on the multitude. God said, that's holiness. 
when you can be touched and moved by the feelings of the multitudes. That's holiness. I followed him to the little woman that was taken in the act of adultery and I saw him forgive her. And they were accusing her and condemning her. If you look in the Bible, and I search diligently, and I can only find one place where he ever condemned anybody, and that was the hypocrites. He didn't he condemn anybody but the hypocrites, the Pharisees. And uh, I saw him as he lovingly said, Neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. This world needs somebody to love it. I found out His holiness is love, forgiveness, mercy. Don't tell me you have holiness and you hold bitterness in your heart. I don't care how you look. I don't care what all you've given up and what all you've taken off. If you have bitterness in your heart, you don't belong to holiness. That's about as plain as I know how to give it. Four or five years ago here, Brother Anthony, a preacher came to me at service one night, and he said, Brother Kilgore, I've got to talk to you. God has dealt with me in this meeting. And he said, I owe you an apology. For 11 years, I've had a, a bitter feeling in my heart against you. And, and he named a conference that I was in charge of, and I had done something. And he said, do you remember what it was? I said, no, my brother, I'm sorry I don't. But he said, would you forgive me? I've carried it 11 years. Imagine carrying something 11 years. But thank God his spirit can reach us. I grabbed him and hugged his neck. He said, I said, my brother, I'm so glad to forgive you. The Lord has forgiven me so many times. I've just been looking for somebody to forgive. We better not hold bitternesses in our heart. My Lord, I've journeyed with him to Calvary. My brother, thou hast traveled far twixt purple east and golden west. The sun set on the polar One God is a treasure chest. Understand the one God. You open up the treasure chest of other great gifts from this God. In Deuteronomy 6 and 4, Moses told that the daily diet of the Jews would be to hear every morning, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Thousands, a few thousand of years later, Jesus is asked by some men, would you tell us what is the greatest commandment of all? The first and the greatest. He said, it is. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. There is no disputing the one God doctrine. Throughout the Bible, Thousands of times, over 7,000 times to be exact, the Bible refers to God as being one God, one Lord.